Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk, and I want to discuss with you a report that's basically being published right now. Um, went to press on December 8th, and I think the printing is just now happening. And basically, this is a 2020 Arctic report card that's been released by the uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And basically, the tagline that's being used is warmer, less frozen, biologically changed, referring to, of course, a summation of what's happening in the Arctic. Now, the uh, this year's lead editor and and uh, a climate specialist, someone I know, uh, Rick Toman. There he is, right there. That's Rick. Um, he's associated with um, the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy, which is associated with uh, the International Arctic Research Center, located on the campus of University of Alaska Fairbanks. And uh, you know, IARC, as they call is my old stomping ground. And um, this is a, a report card that's produced annually. that gives the latest updated information on what is going on with all aspects of the Arctic environment. It is peer reviewed, so it's clear, concise. The findings are basically been vetted out, and it's turning out to be a um, an invaluable resource for scientists, um, folks in the media, policymakers, and for the public. Now, Alaska is kind of weird because from October 2019 to September 2020. We were basically we kind of had normal conditions. It's the what happened in the rest of the Arctic that's kind of like, yeehaw, that's uh, things that are really rapidly changing. Now, this little one year time period in Alaska was kind of a, a step away from the overall warming trend that's been going on in Alaska for the last couple of decades. Now, the heat was most apparent in Siberia. Right? We know about the Siberian fires. We know about the basically the absence of sea ice off Siberia and the East Siberian and Laptev seas in parts of the Kara Sea. What I think the Arctic report card is really good at is showing that the big story is the same, but the regions differ from year to year. And that's a statement from Rick. So what, so what does he do as editor? Well, he coordinates everything. All the papers on uh, temperature, snow, ice, vegetation, biology, fire, okay? topics from 133 scientists in 15 countries, including a whole pile from UAF itself. Uh, for example, Allison York is a wildlife uh, wildfire expert at IARC. Uh, she led the report on the wildfire section. And basically, the, the team described the recent increase in wildfire activity in the Arctic. 2018, Sweden saw an eightfold increase in wildfire activity, something I uh, documented and discussed earlier. And then we saw uh, in 2019, Alaska had some major fires, including one less than 20 miles from my home. And then, of course, uh, we saw what happened in uh, Siberia this past year. So basically, over the past 20 years, there's been unusually large fire season or fire events somewhere in the circumpolar north almost every year. Gabriel uh, Wolken from uh, IARC and Alaska Division of Ge Geological Geophysical Surveys uh, contributed his uh, findings on the glaciers and ice caps. And basically, he documented the enormous glacier melt that occurred during 2018-2019. And so this, you know, this, and here's a picture of Mendenhall Glacier, which is located uh, uh, outside Juneau, Alaska. And that's been melting back like you would not believe. Here's another photo of a wildlife, a wildfire burning in the Krasnoyarsk region of Siberia. Krasnoyarsk is the uh, town that broke 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So let me now switch over to here. Signs of new Arctic is emerging. Now I recently have discussed all the things that's going on with the Arctic. So you may want to check out those recent videos. This appeared in Scientific American 
Record wildfires, dwindling sea ice, ecosystem disruptions all point to the rapid change that the region is undergoing. Now, here is a uh, wildfire. It, this photo is taken in 2014 from Canada's Northwest Territories that burned more than 7 million acres. And of course, when the fires burn, guess what? They're releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. Plus the ground dries out. The ground dries out, it might facilitate thawing of the permafrost, releasing more carbon. So when I discuss this, it's like, we may have to start calling the Arctic something else because it's no longer recognizable as being Arctic. So we got the new, quote, quote unquote, new normal. Right? Not the same place it was decades ago, and, and it won't be the same going forward. And the citing the Arctic report card, which is the one that Rick Coleman, as editor, uh, just uh, put together, which I just shared with you. Let me see if I can. Fortunately, maybe I can click that close. So the report, uh, there's Rick Coleman again. The report card provides a snapshot in time of a region in the middle of transition. Nearly everything in the Arctic from ice, snow, human activity is changing so quickly, there's really no reason to think that in 30 years, much of anything will be as it is today. Temperatures in the Arctic are, current, are currently rising at least twice as fast. New data is suggesting three times as fast, and I just saw a recent paper hinting at four times as fast. In 2020, the Arctic experienced its second warmest year on record. And then, of course, the Arctic Ocean is warming. And wildfires raging across the tundra. Greenland ice is melting. We're losing sea ice. Okay? If you lose the sea ice, instead of reflecting that sun energy back into space, the water, the open water now absorbs that energy further warming the ocean. <coughs> and then that leaves, you know, because you warmed up the ocean so much, it takes more time to cool down before you can even start refreezing. So, sea ice forms later and later in the year, which means it melts earlier in the year and it absorbs more heat energy in the year. And this is why some of the models are showing that Within a year or two, three, we'll have a, a BOE, a blue ocean event, for at least a couple of months of the year. That means totally ice-free, no ice anywhere in the Arctic Ocean. And then eventually, by some point in the mid-2030s to, mid, to maybe 2040, the Arctic Ocean will be completely ice-free year-round. All right. Arctic sea ice is typically hits the slowest extent in September. That's because that's the oceanic summer. This year's minimum was the second lowest on record just behind 2012. Sea ice was especially sparse off the coast of Siberia this year. Uh, let's try non-existent. We saw the spring and summer temperatures were unusually warm. Understatement. The annual summer melt began earlier than usual, June. Ice cover in the Russia's Laptev Sea hit a record low. Fall freeze-up also began later than usual. That's because of all the, the heat energy that needed to be released. Right? Water has a high specific heat content. You have to release that before you can start freezing. And don't forget, with uh, oceanic water, you need to cool it below zero C because of the presence of solutes, salts, right? You have freezing point depression. Scientists say the low sea ice extent, unusually warm temperatures form the vicious cycle. Uh, it's called positive feedback loop. Sea ice helps to reflect sunlight away from the earth when it melts. It allows more heat to reach the planet's surface and the ocean absorb all that heat. Year's early melting likely caused summer temperatures in Leptev Sea to climb even higher, driving more melting in the process. Yep, 
And then if you uh, consider, you know, riverine input, you know, that could also, that introduces uh, water that has temperatures above zero C that can also help melt the sea ice back. We saw a record breaking uh, summer for wildfires within the Arctic Circle, basically what was happening in Siberia. According to the Copernicus Climate Change Service, wildfire activity in Siberia already had already broken last year's record by June. High temperatures and abundance of dry fuel were largely to blame. You warm up the air, and warm air can hold more moisture. It's going to suck the moisture out of the ground, drying out the ground. So if you already have a, an arid region, warmer air it will lead to drier conditions. Although Arctic wildfire activity often varies, uh, you know, considerably from year to year, there's some patterns, long-term patterns emerging. Large fire season, which are classified as burning at least 1,900 square miles of land, have become more common in Alaska over the last 40 years. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, they've slightly declined in Canada's Northwest Territories. Now, data in Siberia only goes back 20 years, so difficult to make any long-term projections. So, the, the basically, the principle here is that rising temperatures increase the likelihood of drier fuels, more frequent, larger wildfires. Much of the dry fuel feeding these uh, fires in the Arctic comes from dead mosses, other plant matter building up in the soil. Freezing temperatures tend to prevent these dead plants from fully decomposing decomposing over the winter, but when the spring thaws out the ground, they rapidly dry out because the air is warmer, can hold more moisture. So the warmer the air, the early the spring, the faster they may dry. As the Arctic report card documents, the region is now experiencing some of the most rapid climate warming on the planet, said Allison York, who I mentioned and discussed earlier. We all know the fire is more likely, more active in warm, dry, windy conditions and fire regimes in high northern latitudes do appear to be responding to the warming that's underway. We also have shifting ecosystems. Climate change is affecting plant and animal life in the Arctic Ocean from the bottom of the food chain up. Tiny algae form the cornerstone of the Arctic's marine ecosystem. Well, I'm going to quibble with the word algae. Algae is a specific type of plant material. These are phytoplankton which are single cell creatures, single cell plant. Each spring when the sea ice melts, and you basically, and I've discussed this many, many times before, right? You get that ice edge productivity. The sea ice melts, you get a little stratification. You get, you can lock in some nutrients right there along with the phytoplankton that do well in, in that condition and in, in, in that uh, environment, and you have a, a bloom. Then as the ice finishes melting back and those phytoplanktons finish out their cycle, the sun gets higher and higher in the atmosphere. And then because of the, the higher sun angle, it can activate the marine phytoplankton and that primary productivity steps up. So basically there are two types of productivity, one from the phytoplankton uh, activity and then uh, from the phytoplankton activity for, with the uh, uh, sea edge, sea ice uh, melting back, and then the second from the marine phytoplankton. So, um, yeah, you have two types of productivity ice edge productivity on the phytoplankton that do well in that situation, which is then followed by the marine phytoplankton after the ice goes away and then the sun angle is high enough to activate those phytoplankton. That's a phenomenon that, so let's see, scientists also notice a second bloom happening in the fall in some places as the hotter summers delay the autumn freeze up. And, goes, and Karen Frey um, basically states that that is something that's new. Um, 
We don't know yet exactly what the contribution in terms of uh, biomass added that that is, but it certainly is an interesting thing to keep an eye out. Um, it may be able to offset uh, some of the loss previously in the year because if you're losing the sea ice, you're losing that productivity from the ice edge phytoplankton. So this may be an offset. I need to look at the numbers. The extra food, that must be referring to this uh, fall uh, productivity, helps some uh, organisms such as the bowhead whale, which have seen some recent population growth. But, it, you know, it may help a few, but it's going to probably, because overall, the total productivity is down. Overall, that's not good for the entire uh, food web system. There's several types of uh, marine phytoplankton in the Arctic, including free-floating uh, phytoplankton and phytos that grow on sea ice, right? When the sea ice melts, that those phyto, those ice phytos uh, basically, you know, do their thing before they sink through the water column uh, down to the ocean floor, where they're then grazed upon by various organisms. Less sea ice means less phytos for these organisms. So that's, this is just a very quick synopsis of some of the materials found in this uh, uh, Arctic report, you know, 2020 Arctic report card, where Rick Tolman is the editor. But, um, and I discuss uh, some of these various things, probably a little more detail, in some of my prior videos, you could, you know, certainly welcome to check out. But uh, yeah, this is the state of uh, the Arctic as uh, 2020 comes to a close. So uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll see what 2021 brings us in terms of what goes on in the Arctic because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Thank you for your time. Hello folks, this is Jim here with Science Talk asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.